of the Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Neville Proctor Marxist Library. And we were founded uh, about 10 or 12 years ago as the research and educational arm of the library. And our purpose is to further the goals of the library in keeping um, the work of Karl Marx um, uh, available. And um, we are a um, diverse group. Uh, the institute is made up of a diverse group of scholars, students, activists. Uh, some of us are members of disciplined parties. Some of us are members of undisciplined parties. And some of us are just independent Marxists with an interest in um, Marx. But uh, we share a uh, very deep respect for the work of Karl Marx and a belief that his work will remain as important for the class struggles of the future as they have been for the past. And to this end, we invite numerous uh, diverse scholars here to talk about different things. And today we have our very own Al Sarges, who is our resident expert on Marxist uh, military and Engel Engelsian. Um, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's close enough. Uh, military Angels. strategy. Yeah, um, and Al will talk for about an hour. Yeah, roughly an hour, um, and then we'll have a break. Uh, announcements, uh, collection, uh, fund appeal, and then we'll go back to some people call it Q and A, but I think lots of it's uh, our our comments and discussion section, which will be led by Al. And then we will close. We need to be out of here. But we need to end by 12.30 because Raj has to pack up and people have other things to do. But you can stay and talk as long as you like, uh, perhaps even past 1 o'clock. We don't know if anybody else is in here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Al. Hi, good morning. Uh, welcome to your uh, once every uh, six to eight weeks uh, discussion of war, chaos, and uh, kindred topics. Um, today, as you notice, that uh, the topic is going to be on uh, Chinese. Uh, political military uh, policies uh, over a 60-year uh, period, uh, back, back 30 years and forward, more or less 30 years. Um, there's a lot of stuff to cover, uh, so a lot of the stuff that I'll discuss is kind of like on a a summary basis. Uh, first, uh, as usual, I, I'll begin with some um, uh, prefaces, introductions, forewords, and other things that uh, are not specifically on the topic but related to it. Um, my interest in uh, China uh, really got pretty heavy in the uh, late 1980s, and I was primarily concerned with uh, contemporary political ideology in China. Uh, and with that, I was interested in, in mainly the post-Mao period. And so a lot of what I, I'll cover today really deals with uh, material uh, on the uh, contemporary ideology in relationship to uh, political military uh, policy. Now, there are three institutions, three main institutions in China. Okay. There's the Communist Party, the Chinese state and the People's Liberation Army. Of the three, one is indispensable and the other two could not exist without it. 
and that is the People's Liberation Army. Um, being all Marxists here, more or less, I would assume that you know that um, um, the Marxist position uh, on war and the military is that the politics and the military are in a dialectical relationship. That is, they're actually one, one in a dialectical relationship. Um, in practice, for example, that means that if you know the types of units in an army, the types of organization of an army, the deployment of an army, the weapons of an army, of a, an army you can, in a sense, reverse engineer it back to the actual political line or political policy of the government in which the army is under. Well, well sorry to interrupt. This shakes if you That's because I shake. Yes. This thing. I'm, I'm, I I'm, don't have my regular stuff. All right, sorry. I'll try to remember. Yeah. Right. You can't be so forceful. <laughs> you can be forceful without counting. Yeah. All right. All right. So what I what I'm saying is I don't I don't really have to know the the politics First, I can understand the military and then trace it back to the politics without knowing the politics first and tracing it back to the military. Yeah, that's what I mean that they're so close in relationship. So that from the Marxist viewpoint, war is politics by mostly violent means. Whereas peace oops, is politics by mostly Nonviolent means, that is, diplomacy, economic trade, and the like. In China, the Chinese position on this is that to understand either war or peace, you have to make a detailed analysis of military, diplomacy, economics, culture, uh, psychology, public opinion. Okay? These are all viewed as kind of like components. Okay, now you, you can break out the military and study that. You can break out uh, psychological warfare and study that, okay? But you have to understand the relationships between all these in order to have a comprehensive view of, of uh, a wartime, peacetime uh, situation. Okay. In no particular order, I'm, I'm dealing with these until I get to the main points. The fourth point is that from the Chinese viewpoint, there is, will be no war between China, that is no direct overt war between China and uh, the United States until at least 2050. And um, there are a number of reasons, which I'll, I'll just give you a couple. Because that's, again, that's not my assessment. That's the assessment of the Chinese government and the Chinese party and the PLA. Um, one, just one example. Um, in um, 2010, uh, one Chinese general uh, wrote that um, the People's Liberation Army, or I'll just abbreviate it, okay, so I go along with the PLA, 
was behind the United States at least 30 years, okay, talk about 19, 2010, at least 30 years behind the United States in weapons and equipment, in organization, and in the application of their doctrine, of their military doctrine. And that's because they began late in comparison to the United States. So we're always playing catch up. Well, you don't want to get involved in a violent conflict if now, today, if you're at least 30 years behind. Doesn't make sense. Now that doesn't mean that in some cases China is not ahead in certain aspects. Yeah. But and doesn't mean that they're on the, not on the same level in certain aspects. That means that they're behind in so many aspects that that's why they say that they're 30 years behind. Now, of course, there's uh, the element of deception, which is constant in war, and constant in the military. Uh, deception means basically not just saying something which is not true. It means saying something which emphasizes the positive or something which emphasizes the negative. Okay, so you see only parts of the truth. So when the guy says 30 years, I say plus or minus five, given the deception factor. Um, Xi Jinping, the current uh, head of the Chinese government and party, said that uh, the modernization of the army's mechanized capacity, that is the capacity, say, to fight a conventional war, uh, will not be achieved until about 2035. And full modernization, that is preparation for an informational war, a war in an informational era, which and I'll mention some of these things in detail later, Okay, will not be uh, achieved until about 2050. So in other words, you talk about a direct overt war between the United States, okay? the Chinese feel that not until about 2050 would China be on an equal level to the United States in such a conflict. But there are, at the same time, there are also hotlines, or I should say red lines, to prevent uh, conflicts from spiraling into uh, major wars. And these include um, hotlines between China and the United States, Be from, for example, from the uh, Central Military Commission, which is the equivalent of their Defense Department, to the Pentagon, from the President of China to the President of the United States, okay? And at lower levels, there are ways in which communication can be quickly uh, run up the ladder, so to speak. Also, let me mention something about my sources. The um, sources of information on the uh, Chinese military, uh, for most persons, unless you really are into it, unless, you, for example, you read Chinese, um, are um, English publications. Uh, I'd say for people that are really interested in just keeping up with things, online you can get the uh, Chinese uh, white papers on defense. Just Google China defense white papers. And they publish these every couple of years and you can get a hold of them. Um, you can also find uh, translations of Chinese stuff. Um, 
mainly by uh, Americans who are uh, foreign area officers, that is, people in the Americans in the military who hang out in China a lot, I'll put it that way, who read uh, Chinese publications a lot, who translate or um, uh, give, um, uh, what's the word, uh, paraphrases, paraphrasing of Chinese publications. That is the best source as far as I'm concerned. Uh, what the military tells itself is better than what the military tells the public. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. So that's why, unless you know how to read the People's Daily or the uh, uh, Global Times, is it? Yeah. or other Chinese publications that are translated in English for a mass audience, okay? <coughs> Unless you know how to read them very selectively and see who writes them, uh, the information tends to be PR stuff. Not that it's not true, but certain things that are true are mentioned. Other things that are true are not mentioned. And sometimes these two things contradict each other to some extent. And the last thing I want to mention is on um, the question of Chinese analysis of foreign policy in general. The Chinese analysis tends to be overwhelmingly not Marxist yeah, and not class-based, but based on um, geopolitics. Geopolitics. Um, Last time I was in China, I spoke with a friend of mine who was a specialist in international relations, who's a Marxist, and she told me, Al, you know, we don't have much influence. So most of the people in China who study this stuff and who make recommendations do it not from a Marxist viewpoint, from, but from a geopolitical viewpoint. I said, well, I said, how much uh, influence do you have in terms of percent? Could you give me an estimate? And she said, well under 10%. Yeah. So I fear that's 5 to 8%. And if you read, again, the Chinese stuff, unless you read the left Chinese journals, in which it's close to 100% of... Uh, from a class viewpoint, but in the majority of stuff that you read, okay, you do not get a Marxist viewpoint of international relations. Okay, that was my preface. Okay, so I'm going to look at different periods, uh, and I'm going to go back first to the Maoist period. Then I'm going to discuss the reform period and the major framework for the reform period and then different phases of the reform period up to today. The Maoist period was from 1949 to uh, 1976. And this was a period of where uh, wars and uh, class struggles were a dominant theme, that the relations of production was a focus, that a leadership struggle with the Soviet Union over Communist Party world leadership, especially in the third world, was a major theme, that war with imperialism and social imperialism on Chinese territory was the dominant belief that because the war was going to be on Chinese territory, that industries were moved to the interior, that different capitals uh, were um, uh, designated within the uh, interior, 
that this was going to be a protracted or long war lasting many years. That it would most likely begin with a nuclear attack on China, which China would survive because of its size and because of the large population. That after the nuclear attack, there would be a ground invasion. The Chinese army would retreat inland And it would lure the enemy, right? Lure the enemy uh, into the country. Now, once the enemy was lured into the country, millions of people in the militia would harass and deplete the invader until the large People's Liberation Main Army would surround the enemy, attack them cut off their supply and communications, mm -hmm. and eventually defeat them. Mao's army was not just a fighting army, but it was an economic productive force, and it was an army which supported uh, uh, people's various activities. And of course, it was composed primarily of peasants and to a lesser degree of workers. Now, with the demise, with, with Mao's death and the demise of the Gang of uh, Four, a new ideology began to develop. I'd say this was towards the late 70s. And that was called the primary stage of socialism. Um, in a sense, the primary stage of socialism was, uh, should say, had its origins in the party congress in 1958, where it was said that well, class struggle should not be primary, but building the economy should be primary. Okay? In the, and in the primary stage of socialism, the basic idea was that between 1949 and 2049, the goal was to build the economic, social, and democratic prerequisites for Socialism. Okay, prerequisites for socialism. Um, by about 2050, they would be prepared to advance to the next stage, which would uh, be uh, constructing a basic socialist formation. But between now and then, there are specific goals for specific periods of time to be achieved, largely economic goals. And all leaders since Deng Xiaoping have followed this path of the primary stage of socialism, building the prerequisites for a basic socialist formation. What was the guarantee for this, that they would follow that path? Well, the guarantee was supposed to be the four cardinal principles. I uh, happened to have a, must have been, gee, it seemed like 20 hours, but I guess it was about a 10 hour discussion with the, an old theorist who was one of the ones who developed this idea of the four cardinal principles. And he had you know, a long time discussing you know, how he and Deng Xiaoping would have big discussions and how they formed committees to analyze uh, Chinese society and what the path, how to stay on that path. And the four cardinal principles uh, were basically Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought as the ideology, a proletarian dictatorship, a socialist economic path, and most importantly, he said, 
leadership by the Communist Party. Now, after Mao, the reform period, or the Deng Xiaoping period, in terms of, the, say, the international aspect, was a period of peace and development. And this lasted from approximately 1978 to 1992. In 1975, Deng Xiaoping made a speech about the army, in which he said the army was bloated, too many people, that the officers had extravagant lifestyles, which led to corruption, that the troops were poorly trained to fight a modern war, that they were not educated enough I mean, you had peasants with the equivalent of an elementary school education which formed the army, which might be great for a guerrilla warfare, but anything more sophisticated required higher levels of education. That there was too much emphasis on the army being involved in economic production, on supporting people's activities, on ideological training, and uh, on factional infighting, mm. taking sides uh, between factions within the party. Deng's, Deng's policy of peace and development suggested that there would be no major war, especially a nuclear war, for the foreseeable future, and that limited local wars would be the norm. Now, this gave the uh, army, of, or pardon me, the country, a breathing space to focus on economic production rather than class struggle, and to create a national army which would be suited to local wars on China's periphery rather than within the mainland itself. In the local wars, the opponent would probably not be a superpower. It would involve fighting either in neighboring countries or on the, uh, the seas surrounding China that it would be a short war, relatively speaking, <laughs> and that it would be fought not by large armies, but by what they called rapid reaction forces. Okay, well, I'll get into that a little later as to what it meant by rapid reaction forces. What tended to confirm this was China's invasion of Vietnam in 1979. That short war pointed up everything that Deng Xiaoping had said earlier. The lines of communication were too long. The command and control was, uh, let's just say, so long that, and, and with so many loopholes. Okay, uh, the supply, like I said, the supply lines were uh, inadequate. Uh, the army was simply not trained to fight that kind of conventional war. Okay? And that just reaffirmed, as I say, what Deng Xiaoping had said. So, 